Thank you for joining us today. We love to hear your testimony about how God is using destiny in your life. You can visit our website, destinychurchjacksonville.com and click on the testimony link. Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online. Now, get ready to receive a word from God. Well, as you guys are making your way to your seat, can we just thank our sound, our media, and our worship team for working hard each and every week to create an atmosphere by which we can come together and worship God. Come on, can we just thank them for that? And can we thank God who shows up not only every week, but every day, every hour, every minute, every second of our life who promises that he will never leave us nor forsake us. I think Destiny Church can do a little bit better than that because God has been good to you. He's good, amen? God is good. And all the time. Come on. Y'all been in church for a while if you know that little right there. But it's still true, amen? Come on. Well, I want to welcome everyone to Destiny Church. I want to just chime in with my wife said and welcome our, our guests. So can we welcome our guests today? Uh, we are just so honored to have you here this morning. We know there's a lot that you could be doing on a Sunday morning. And and so uh, we want to welcome you and also want to welcome you to week two of our series, Legacy. If you didn't catch last week's message, you can always catch any of our messages online, on our uh, podcast, church website, YouTube. By the way, we want to welcome our online audience. It's uh, good to have you guys tune in with us. And if you weren't here what I'll do is I'll try to maybe do a little bit of a recap of last week as we dive into today's message. And I'll start with giving you what I believe is kind of the overall theme of this series. Legacy is about us living our lives in such a way that it makes a difference. And we talked a little bit about this last week, and, and I want to highlight it again. And that's that you and I are already hardwired to make a difference. God has placed that in each and every one of our hearts. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says this. It says, he has made everything beautiful at its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. In other words, he's placed something within us. He's placed within us a desire for something greater. Something greater than just getting a raise at our job. Even though that would be nice, right? <laughs> Even though... I'm talking about having a greater desire for a nicer vacation, a dream vacation, a dream car, or, or a dream home, but something that's going to have lasting significance. And what I want to do today is I want to share with you what I believe is a, a powerful motivation. It's a motivation that's caused people to, to move to the ends of the earth. It's a motivation that's caused people to build orphanages. It's a motivation that's caused Christianity to spread all over the world. And it's a motivation that once you possess it, it will change how you live. And it will also solve a lot of the problems that you'll face in life. And it's simply that there's more to this life than this life. And you know, this is what the Bible uses oftentimes for, for motivation, really in almost everything that we do, for, for legacy, for, for generosity, for all things compassion. It uses the topic of heaven. I'm talking about the fact that how that one day we will all stand before God and that we have this opportunity here while on earth to live it in such a way that we can make a difference in eternity. If you'll study the Bible and what it says about touching people's lives, you'll find that it usually starts with that motivation, that heaven is the reason that we do it, to store up treasures in heaven. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Now, many of you know this about me, but I've been in ministry now for over 20 years. And during that time, I've had to walk people through a lot of crisis, many of which were some of the darkest moments that you could possibly imagine. I've had to do funeral of, of children who died tragically. I've had to do funeral of those who were murdered and yet others who died very quickly and unexpectedly. One of those was my own mom. 
But in the midst of these terrible tragedies and the accompanying grief, I've also noticed what the Bible calls the blessed hope, the knowing that one day we'll see them again. And I've just got to tell you, as someone who's walked through a tragedy, I am so thankful and grateful for the hope of heaven. Amen? Because you see, when you have that hope, it changes everything. It gives you a completely different perspective on life. Not only that, but it also changes how you live. It, cha- it, changes, it, it changes how you treat others. It changes how you spend your money. It changes how you spend your time. And I said that the Bible often mentions heaven and, and, and using that as a motivation. And this morning, I want to share with you two places in Scripture where it does just that. And it's my prayer that we'll begin to live more and more with this eternal perspective. Now, I shared this scripture with you in the end of last week's message, so we'll kind of pick back up on this scripture, but I want to highlight it and read it one more time. It was 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. And the scripture says to command those who are rich, which, by the way, that's all of you in this room. Are you hearing me? I don't care if you make minimum wage. That still puts you in the category of the richest of the world, okay? Command those who are rich in this present world. Again, the scripture is highlighting the reality that this isn't the only world, that this isn't all that there is. Command them to not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides for us everything for our enjoyment. As a matter of fact, I think it's kind of important important right here that we note that the things that God gives us, he doesn't expect us to give it all away. I mean, like there's some people that would teach you that. They're like, God just wants you to be poor and anything you ever get, you're to give away. But that's not what the scripture says. It says here that he richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. It goes on to say, to command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. See, there's the balance, right? In this way, they will lay up for themselves uh, treasures as as a firm foundation for the coming age. See, this is our focal point right here. This is where we need to fix our focus. It says, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Now, here's what I want to give you today. That there's a life beyond this life, and you will want to invest more into that life in every way. And I want you to see how that important it is that we invest in that life that's to come. You see, there, there's a present age here, but the Bible repeatedly talks about the coming age. And we need to be spending more time, more energy, more resources on that coming age. I'm talking about our life and all that it entails being driven by eternity. And here's why. Are you ready? Because heaven, not earth, is my home. And when we get to that place of understanding that we're just passing through, that this isn't our final destination, that truth changes everything. See, I feel like that's some of the best pastoral advice that I could ever give you. That when you're facing troubles and difficulties here on earth, it's just temporary. You're just passing through. It's not how the story ends. Jesus says these words in John chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Then listen to what Jesus says next. It's it's the motivation of of heaven that we're talking about here. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, and take you to myself that where I am you'll be also. You see, every time that the disciples came to Jesus with an earthly problem, he directed them to a heavenly solution. Because the real solutions for your life, they're not here, they're there. You're just passing through. Listen to what Paul says. And I love the fact that he says this from a prison cell. I think it's so significant because oftentimes people can't grasp this perspective because they've got it so blindingly good. 
In Philippians 3, 18 and 20, Paul says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. In other words, their God is indulgence. The thing that God had meant for them to use as their um, enjoyment, uh, it became an idol. They allowed to become an idol. Scripture goes on to say, in their glory is in their shame. And here's why they're the enemies of the cross of Christ. It says, their mind is on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Church, it's so easy for us to get fixated and consumed by the things of the earth. Whether it's politics, money, success, or comfort. But Paul reminds us that we are citizens of heaven. And as such, we should fix our gaze toward heaven. Remember what Jesus taught us to pray? Pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, we don't look to the things of the world to fix the world. We look to heaven in order for this world to be changed. Church, here's a thought. As citizens of heaven, we bring heaven to earth. Or at least we should be. That's why we're called the ambassadors of Christ. We're re to represent the kingdom of heaven everywhere we go. We're called of agents of change here on this earth. And the way that we bring that change is by focusing upward. You say, Pastor, what do, you, what do you mean by that? I'm talking about living as citizens of heaven. Living as Jesus taught us to live. Because watch this, that's what the world needs. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, to let your light shine before men in such a way that they would see your good deeds. And then do what? Give glory to your Father who's in heaven. Listen, I'm sure everyone here has probably considered this, but I feel compelled to remind you, this life is temporary. This is, there's a, a one-time shot that we have here during this brief period that we call time to make an eternal difference. Which brings me to the second reason that you need to fix your, your time, your energy, and your passions toward eternity. Because there's limited time and incredible opportunity. Let me ask, how many of you have found yourself becoming more and more aware of the fact of how short time is? Well, if it's not hit you, just let a little bit of time pass by and eventually it will. But not only do we have limited time, but watch this, we also have incredible opportunity. See, oftentimes, I think the American church is the guy in the parable of the talents that we're given the five talents. I just pray that we're not acting like the person who was given the one. Are you hearing me, church? Ephesians 5, verses 15 and 16 says, be very careful then how you live. Watch this, look at me. How you live matters. I said how you live matters. Don't be using grace as your trump card to just think that you can live however you want. Paul said, you know, do I go and live however I want so that grace would abound? He said, God forbid it. Be very careful then as to how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Watch this. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Church, there is opportunity all around us. And the kind of opportunity that I'm talking about here is the opportunity that leads to life change. For example, you have the opportunity every day to encourage someone. You have the opportunity to redirect a portion of your finances towards something that will have eternal significance. It's just a matter of what you make a priority. You have the opportunity to give of your time and serve in a multitude of ways. And if you don't know how to serve, if you're here and say, man, I'd love to, but I really don't know how to do that. One thing that we've tried to do at Destiny is to try to make it easy for you to be able to serve. There's tons of ways that you can serve here at the church, but there's tons of opportunities that we have that we can connect you with, ways that you can serve all throughout the week with different amazing organizations that are doing great things. But you see, I wonder... If many people pass on these opportunities of things they can do because they don't see that thing as significant. I shared a story with you last week 
of my wife where she had just been every day dropping little, you know, words of encouragement to a friend of hers at work and then invited her to church and it completely changed her life. Everything that we do, if anything matters, it all matters. And we all have an opportunity each and every day to be able to make a difference in someone's life. And watch this, and I think I need to say this, some of those opportunities, sure, they're gonna take you outside your comfort zone and they will require something of you, but I promise you that the goal is worth the effort. Are you hearing me this morning? The prize is worth the prize. So what I think usually happens is that opportunities are often disguised as hard work and so people ignore them. Unfortunately, we live in a culture that expects much from giving nothing. But the Bible teaches us this, that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. That's in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Church, excuses will always be there for you. Opportunity won't. Are you hearing me? Listen, I'm going to share with you what I believe will be the key for some of you grabbing hold of the opportunities that you have. And I'm trying to make this just as practical as as I can make it. But this is your POA, your plan of action. And this is going to sound really simple. That's because it is. Ready? Set a time. That's the first thing you need to do. Set a time. Sit down and literally say, we're going to sit down as a family, as a couple. If you're a single, sit down with yourself and maybe a friend. But sit down and say, I'm going to set a time to really think about this because this matters. If y'all agree that this matters, that eternity matters, then we need to first start with some simple steps. Set a time. Then set and think through how you can possibly bring about change, how you can bring heaven to earth. And pray and allow God to give you creative ideas. The Holy Spirit is creative, church. And just say, Lord, give me ideas. Give me ways that I can affect the kingdom of God. And no matter how small it is, can I just tell you God's on the small stuff? If you think he's not, then remember what he said about the widow's might. God is into the small things. That's one of the things I love about God. It's not just that he's into the big things, but he's also into the small things, right? But set a time, then think about how you can make a change, and then put it down on paper. Like, write those things down so that it's not just a conversation. As a matter of fact, the Bible says to, to write the vision. Put it down plain on tablets so that the reader may run with it. So there's something that's powerful, and there's a spiritual principle there behind us putting those things down on paper. And then watch this. Then schedule it. Put it on the schedule. Say, I'm going to do it on this day. Mark Batterson in one of his books uh, says that a deadline is oftentimes a lifeline. Because if we just say, oh, I'll get around to it, and we never schedule it, we have these good intentions, we have these great ideas, but if we don't schedule it, we never get around to it. So you need to schedule it. Then once you've scheduled it, follow through with it. Do it. And I wish I could, I, I could sit up here for the next couple hours and tell you of times that I did things that honestly going into it, I didn't think it was going to have that great of a significance, just little small things, but they ended up being life-changing moments. God just needs a people who are faithful, a people who are available, and a people who are teachable. Will you be one? Will you be one? Will you be available for God to use? Will you be faithful? Will you be teachable? Will you be open to the spirit of God um, challenging in you and and causing you to step outside of your comfort zone so that souls could be changed, so that lives could be changed? Do something that's going to show up in heaven. Do something that's going to show up in heaven. Jesus says this in a much more eloquent way in Matthew 6, 19, verse 21, when he says, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them. Come on, we know about stuff getting rusted up here in Florida. Bought some chairs three months ago, and those things are already rusted to pieces because the things here are temporary, right? Don't store treasures up here on the earth where moths eat them and rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. There's often an overlooked truth here 
that Jesus mentions at the end of this verse. He says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. In other words, start serving and giving of yourself and watch how your heart begins to shift and your desires begin to change. See, I think that oftentimes we just wait until uh, our heart is moved in a certain direction before we serve or before we give. But Jesus tells us that our heart will follow our treasure. And our treasure is our time, our talent, our resources, and our money. Jesus says that whatever, wherever you're giving that, your heart's going to follow. You say, Pastor, but how do I know what I should give my time, my talent, my resources to? Well, I've already said it, but I'll say it again, to something that will show up in heaven. To something that's going to make an eternal difference. And church, I just think, I mean, come on, let's, let's talk family for a minute, all right? Kind of just not be pastor and be your brother for a minute in Christ and just say, look, we, we need to ask ourselves these questions. I'm asking these questions with my family. Just this last week, a lot of our conversation was about stuff that's going to outlive us. I don't want to consume everything that God gives me. I don't want to consume the time that God has given me just on me and just on my family. Although I, I believe that some of it is to be given to my family. I, but I think that God has called me to more than just my family. And God's called you to more, more than just your family. He's called you to your family. Some of us need to spend a little more time on our family. But he's also called us to do so much more. He's called us and, and, and promised us, promised us that he would give us the nations as our inheritance if we would just ask. So we've got to say, what am I giving toward that's going to show up in heaven? What am I doing that's going to make an eternal difference? Jesus tells us why we should do that there in Matthew chapter 6. He says, because those are the things that will really last. Like, our cars aren't going to be on the road in 100 years from now. <laughs> like, likely our houses aren't still going to be standing 100 years from now. I mean, good, good possibility, should the Lord tarry, that they're going to get knocked down and another one will be built in its place, right? But there are things that we can invest in that will last for eternity. Are y'all hearing me this morning, church? And so this is why we should live a legacy life. But now I want to share with you how to live a legacy life. And I'm going to start with reading you a parable that Jesus told. And if you're new to church, a parable is simply a story that's used to illustrate a spiritual or a, a moral lesson. And in most every instance that Jesus tells one, it contains different applications for life. And interestingly, this parable here is called the parable of the rich fool. And it's found in Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. And Jesus is the one sharing this. He said, the ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. In other words, he's saying the rich got richer, right? And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store, now watch this language here, my crops, my stuff. He says then, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my, my smaller barns and I'll build bigger barns. And there I will store my surplus grain. So this man believes that his extra was for his keeping. He said, and I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for years. Now this is where he's totally wrong. Because he thought that because he had more stuff, that he had more time. And those two don't correlate. Take life easy. Eat, drink. And be merry, he said. Now, at this point in the story, and if it were to stop here, you might think that Jesus was given a good lesson on saving, right? But Jesus flips the script. And he says, but God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? It certainly wouldn't be the rich man, right? Then Jesus brings home this parable with a, a spiritual truth. He says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. See, Jesus introduces this concept that we all need to have in our heart about being rich toward God. 
And I'm gonna show you how you can be rich toward God. How you can have a, let's call it a heavenly portfolio, which hopefully one day will lead to saying Jesus, saying to us, well done, good and faithful servant. And here's the first one, are you ready? Give yourself to God. See, I become rich toward God when I give myself to God. And I want you to grab hold of this because church, this is a foundational principle. One that you can't move forward, you can't move past until you get it. Really, it's what it means when we say to make Jesus the Lord of our life. It's saying that all of who we are becomes his. See, here's the thing that I want you to see. Jesus never really asks for our stuff. He asks for you. But when Jesus gets me, he gets all of me, not just a percentage of me. I heard a quote once that I believe that is so true. It was by a man named John Bonnell. And he said, if one first gives himself to the Lord, all other giving is easy. Come on, isn't that good? But giving ourselves to the Lord means that our lives are no longer our own. They belong to God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says it that way in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. It says, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Honor God with every part of your life. How do we do that? Well, here's the second how. We do it by acting like a steward, not an owner. That means that you manage your life in such a way that it's God-honoring. Manage your time, manage your family, manage your job, manage your resources like it belongs to God. Because it does. And a good practical way to approach doing this is to simply ask God what you should do with what he's given you. As a matter of fact, through the years at Destiny, we've had the opportunity uh, to give large amounts of money to uh, various things that have made and are going to continue to make eternal significance. And when we've given to those things, I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, because I'm pretty deliberate about the word selection that I grab hold of when I'm up here, because if I'm speaking for God, I better be, right? And um, I, I've determined to never ask you to give. But I've always asked you to ask God what you're supposed to give, right? Because I don't own you either. God does. As a matter of fact, Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Now, I just want to address this in case there's anyone here that says, yeah, well, but I've worked for what I've got. That, that's, my, that's mine. No, ma'am. No, sir. It absolutely is not. Deuteronomy 8.18 says, but remember, as in don't forget this. Remember that it is the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Hey, you may have showed up at the job site, but God put breath in your lungs. He gave you those ideas. He gave you that ability. And so we've got to live our lives like a steward and not an owner. And here's the third way that I can be rich toward God. I'm going to view everything through the lens of eternity. And church, this is right at the heart of this series on legacy, to be eternally minded in everything that we do, to see our waiter or our, our waitress through the eyes of eternity, through the lens of eternity, to see our employees, to see our boss I know it takes faith sometimes, through the lens of eternity. I'm talking about us living our lives and conducting our affairs in such a way as to recognize that what we do here on earth, that it will affect their heaven. And this isn't always the easiest route to take, but it is the best route. It's the route that will resound throughout all of eternity. As a matter of fact, listen to what the scripture has to say in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews eleven twenty five through 26, a little scripture there, a little portion of scripture that, that talks about the life of Moses. And he says that Moses chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. You see, he could have been living it up lavishly in Egypt, but, but he didn't. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God. 
rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. You see, he was thinking about the long term and not the short term. And church, that's what I'm trying to get you to do this morning, is to think long term investment, not just short term. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. He was viewing his life through the lens of eternity. And then the fourth and the last thought that I have for you. And this is the one where the ball is in your court. This is where, if I can say it this way, where the rubber meets the road. It takes this idea, this concept, and it makes it a reality. And that's be intentional. Now, if you were here for last week's message, then you heard me say this word several times, and I promise you, you're gonna hear me say it several more times throughout this series. Because if we stop short of this fourth thought, then it would have just been a good idea. This is where we put into practice the truth that we've received. Now, I'm gonna read to you what 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, and I wanna read, to it, read it from the message translation because I love how it articulates uh, this point here of being intentional. It says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. So this is going back to what we were talking about earlier. We need to set a time. We need to sit and we need to think about how we can invest in eternity. It's very important that we do this. It says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and to make up your own mind, to predetermine it. Make up your mind as to what you're gonna give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. Isn't that good? I like that. Because God knows that happens in the world and in the church. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. The scripture essentially says here that we need to decide what we wanna give our life to. Don't just wait and think that you'll do it in the moment. Because if you do, there's a great chance that one of two things will happen. One is that you could be manipulating into giving to something that you really don't wanna give to. Or you'll allow yourself to talk yourself out of it, which is usually what most people allow to happen. But how we combat that is by predetermining. Determine. Determine that you're going to give 10% of your income to eternity. Determine that you're going to serve at least once a week. And I'm not just talking about the type of serving that's a lifestyle, but to say in some form or fashion, I am going to serve. I'm going to serve this week. I'm going to put it on my schedule. And there's so many ways to serve. Serve at the Boys and Girls Club. Serve at Cup of Love. Serve, put together a package for Operation Gratitude. Serve, serve, serve First Coast Women's Services. They have a ton of ways that you can serve. Sign up to be a greeter. Join a hospitality team. Start a, a community group. There's endless ways to be able to serve. If you feel like you can't find a way to serve, I promise you we will connect you with a way to serve. But the launch pad for living a life of legacy is to be intentional. Be intentional in giving encouragement. Be intentional in serving. Be intentional in how much time you give to something. Be intentional in giving your gifts and your talents and your resources that God has given you. Invest them where you're going to see the greatest return, a heavenly return. Amen? Amen. Now, in closing, let me leave you with this thought. You'll miss the time you spend on selfish pursuits. You'll miss the energy that you exert in self-serving acts. And you'll miss the money that you spend on self-centered things. But watch this. You will never miss what you invest in eternity. Come on, do you believe it? All right, stand to your feet with me this morning. Bless you, Lord.